today we're going to do a lot of reading uh, for this chapter. They're kind of uh, glued together. We can do, you know, a few verses here and there, but we're just going to go through chapter 21 and chapter 22 and see what the Lord has for us today. Before that, let's pray together. Lord, we thank you again for your presence with us, the assurance that you are with us. And we thank you for your word that is open before us, how we pray that as we go through it, that your Holy Spirit uh, would remind us of this truth and cause our hearts really to yield to your word that we may do and follow after you. Uh, Holy Spirit, we ask that you would open our understanding to receive you this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. We have seen uh, often what is, you know, drifting towards the end of this chapter and what is happening really. Um, the, the, the promises and the things that God had told Paul, they're coming to pass. Just at the onset of his ministry, uh, Jesus told him that he would suffer for the sake of the gospel. And we have seen great dedication, great zeal for this man serving the Lord and just giving himself uh, totally for, for, for the gospel. And last week, our, uh, the chapter that we read, also Paul told us that in every city where he went, the Holy Spirit told him, that he's going to suffer in Jerusalem. So it's not something that he's unaware of. So what we're going to talk about today, uh, our, our title is, When You Are Misunderstood. I know many of you have been misunderstood, uh, uh, probably with your spouse, with your friends, with your colleague, your boss, um, yeah, everyone, you know, you've been misunderstood for whatever reason. Maybe there are things you, you didn't communicate clearly, or you just sh shot a text and they interpreted the way they wanted it, and, you know, just troubles everywhere. And we do not like being in that state uh, where your life is carrying a lot of misunderstandings. And we are going to see you know, three groups of people who actually misunderstood Paul. Some were intentional, some were not, but at the end of the day, they misunderstood him. The first group of people were his friends. And we're going to see that uh, from verses 1 to 16. And then the second group of people were the church family from verses 17 to 26. And then the religious and the civil leaders from verses 27 uh, sliding into chapter 22. Oftentimes when we are misunderstood, we fight harder to make our cases or perhaps we're trying to redeem our names. But the question is, what is our interest when we are making a case? What is our interest when we are trying to defend ourselves? Because at some point, you know, you will hear things and you want to defend yourselves. You want to say a few words so that people don't go in further, um, uh, further misunderstanding, that is to say. Do we just want to look great and ignore the real issues that brought the misunderstanding? Or do we want to hold on to the truth amidst all these things? So the way we will approach it really would uh, communicate if we are holding on to the truth or we want to compromise for the sake of our names. Paul here, the Bible says, now it came to pass that when we had departed from them and sailed, running a straight course, we came to coast, 
uh, the following day to Rhodes and from there to uh, Patara. And finding a ship sailing over to Phoenicia, we went abroad and set sail. And when we uh, had sighted Cyprus, we passed it on the left, sailed to Syria and landed at Tyre. For there uh, the ship was to unload her cargo. And finding disciples, we stayed there seven days. They told us, they told Paul through the Spirit not to go up to Jerusalem. Let's pause there for a minute and think about this. Um, the Lord had spoken to um, Paul in a previous verse or previous chapter, verses uh, 22. It says, and see now I go bound in the spirit to Jerusalem, not knowing the things that will happen there to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testified in every city, saying that chains and tribulations await me. But none of these things move me. And we get here to a point where he's met other believers, he's spend a little time with them, and they have learned what Paul is going to do or what is going to happen in the life of Paul the Apostle in Jerusalem. And this is what they say. They told Paul through the Spirit not to go up to Jerusalem. So friends, is this a confusion? That the same Spirit is speaking to these believers and they're telling Paul, don't go to Jerusalem. Why? Because of the things that are awaiting. And Paul also has said that I must go there. The Holy Spirit has told me that chains and tribulations, they are waiting for me. So what are we going to do? If both parties are listening to the Holy Spirit, why is it not consistent? Why is it not consistent? Do you have people that you, you really love, you really love, and you know that whatever place they're going, they're going to suffer? Normally, what do we do when we know that that is the case? What do we do? We tell them to kutende resa, to onane. God be with you. Is that what we tell them? Many times we will restrain them. Why? The natural instincts of us humans don't like suffering. And when we learn that our loved ones are going to suffer, we do every possible thing to tell them not to go. And this is not to say that now the Holy Spirit spoke to this group of people. No, it was their love for Paul that drove them to tell him, don't go to Jerusalem. Look at what God has used you to do. Look at the marvelous things that God has allowed you to do throughout these years. Look at the work that you began even here. I mean, if you go to Jerusalem, you're going to be bound, they're going to, you're going to be in chain. In other words, you're not going to preach the gospel anymore. Consider it. And sometimes it feels wise for a moment. But how do we ought to conduct ourselves? You know, one of the possible reasons is when you love people, you have them at heart, you pray for them, that they will not go through suffering. And in many cases, we ignore the reason why we go through this suffering. And suffering um, can be categorized in three portions. There, there is suffering that comes to us because we are sharing the gospel. We're going to, through 
tribulation. People will speak bad about you. They'll reject you. They'll throw stones at you. They'll do a lot of things to you because of the gospel. There is suffering that we have brought upon ourselves without proper judgment. Things that we have heaped upon ourselves because we didn't take time to pray about issues, to consider things, we didn't discern the right things to do. We acted rashly or foolishly and a lot of suffering came upon us. And also there is the suffering because we just live in a fallen world. We get sick every time. A lot of you have homa, right? <laughs> we, we get sick every day. These things are not going anywhere. We, we uh, a lot of people are suffering from cancers and, and a lot of diseases. Just because we're living in a fallen world. We suffer. But the one that Paul is going through is what was promised by God. Go tell him how many things he must suffer. And so for those who are suffering in here, <laughs> which one? Which category are you? Is it the middle one? <laughs> Most of the time, the things we have brought upon ourselves. The Lord told us to go this way, we chose to go the other way. What happens? We're still going to go through that. And so they say, uh, don't go down to Jerusalem because of their love for Paul. And when we had come to the end of those days, we departed and went on our way. And they all accompanied us with wives and children until we were out of the city. We knelt down and on the shore and prayed. You know, this, they, they, they implore him not to go, but he chose to go anyways. Which voice do you want to follow? Because they all seem valid. They all seem to be good. These are the people who care about you. And also remember that these people are not being malicious. It is just out of love that they don't want you to suffer. But also when we hear these words from the people we love, what are we going to do about it? Ignore the voice of God? When we had taken our leaves of one another, we boarded the ship and they returned home. And when we had finished, our voyage from Tyre, we came to Ptolemais, greeted the brethren, and stayed with them one day. On the next day, we who were Paul's companion departed and came to Caesarea and entered the house of Philip the evangelist, who was one of the seven and stayed with him. You guys remember Philip. We talked about Philip. The Philip was one of the seven deacons who were appointed in the church to administer health to people. There, were, uh, there was a trouble in terms of distribution, especially to the widows. And they cried out, and the elders said, well, this is what we're going to do. We're going to appoint uh, deacons who are going to take charge of that while we concentrate in prayers and dividing of God's word and preaching. And he was, he was one of them. Apparently, he's the only one that the New Testament writers call the evangelist. Philip the evangelist. 
He preached to the Ethiopian eunuch. The, 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 he was caught in the spirit. He went and explained the scrolls and the, the Bible to the eunuch. He got born again and the spirit took him away. And when there was trouble in Jerusalem, when people were now flying away because there's great persecution, also Philip went away. And do you know the, the, uh, amongst the people who were persecuting the church, do you know who was present? Was Saul of Tarsus. This is 20 years down the line and he shows up at your door. <laughs> you remember what he did? People fled because of him. He's going to give that testimony here, how he persecuted the church. And maybe they never talked with Philip, and now he shows up at your door. What are you going to do? You're like, hey, we, 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 we're born again. We are all Christian, but just please go your way. <laughs> do, do your thing, but not, don't, don't do it in my house. We see a picture of God's grace that comes upon his people when we accept him. That even the uh, people who might have wronged you, when you have received the grace of God, do you let things go? In, in Titus, as Paul is writing to this young pastor, he says that, that the grace of God has appeared to us, the grace that teaches us to deny ungodly things, ungodly resentment, and to embrace that which we have received from God. In the light of that, when you have received the grace of God, the way you treat people is different. You don't regard them as your enemies. If you want to hold them as your enemies, Jesus also said, pray for your enemies. <laughs> so you, you either choose, you pray for them as your enemies or as your brothers. Which one is easier? <laughs> he shows up here at the house of uh, Philip the Evangelist. And the Bible tells us now this man, Philip, had four virgin daughters who prophesied. Four virgin daughters who prophesied. Never seen any man. Uh, they have dedicated their lives to the declaration of the word of God. As we've been going through this book, uh, the book of Acts, we have seen how this word is used. To prophesy basically is to declare forth the will of God or the word of God to people. And God has used Many people, you remember uh, the prophecy uh, that your sons and daughters shall prophesy. The prophecy has been made alive and made true in the book of Acts as we see this unfolding. And he, I, I was wondering this kind of relationship. You know, he, he's an evangelist and the four daughters, prophets. <laughs> You think about that, you know, the, the, the father is trying to send them to do something like that. Thou shall not. <laughs> uh, thou sayest the Lord, thou shall not send thy daughter tonight. I shall not heed your word. <laughs> it, it, it is an interesting relationship. But you would see the dedication to um, serving the Lord and to declare the word of God is based on their relationship with their earthly father, that is Philip. His commitment to the Lord has raised these children well. So as opposed to what we have been studying about the life of David, the Bible says some of his sons, he never told them no one time. Think about it. You've never told your children no for one time. The kind of children they're going to grow to become. If you don't tell them no today, they will tell you no in front of people. It will be shameful. You would want to go under the earth and there will be no opportunity for that. You're going to deal with it. 
all the shame and condemnation and all these things will come upon you. And you're like, man, I'm, I'm the worst parent. If children would go into rebellion, let them go because they have chosen it, not because they were not trained. For the Bible says you train them in the ways of the Lord that when they are of age, they will not depart from it. Philip had four of them, dedicated ones. And as we stayed many days, a certain prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. You also re, uh, remember him from chapter 11. He's the one who prophesied drought, and it actually happened. And that was the test of prophets. If you prophesy that something is going to happen, if it happens, then we check the box. This is from the Lord, and the Lord spoke. And now he's been sent here also with a specific uh, word. When he had come to us, he took Paul's belt, bound his own hands and feet, and said, Thus says the Holy Spirit, so that the Jews at Jerusalem bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. Now when we heard these things, both we and those from that place pleaded with him not to go to Jerusalem. This is now the second time they are pleading with Paul not to go to Jerusalem. Why? Because of the pain that is awaiting him in Jerusalem. In this manner, the one who owns this belt is going to be bound and be delivered to the Gentiles. This is who's saying the Holy Spirit is saying. So you see, the first he said the Holy Spirit has said it. And then these other uh, men and women told Paul through the Spirit not to go up to Jerusalem. And now through the same Spirit that communicated this to Paul, says these are bound to happen. If this belt belongs to you, <laughs> this is going to happen in Jerusalem. Think about it, you know, I come to your house maybe or whatever here and I, I take your pass and say, whoever this pass belongs to, <laughs> this is what is going to happen to you tomorrow when you go to the county hall. <laughs> They're going to whip you. They're going to beat you up. You're going to be bloody. You're going to suffer. You ready? Like, that pass don't even look like mine. <laughs> and it's your phone inside. Is this phone yours? Mm. <laughs> you, no, 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 no. You, you're trying to think about it. You're trying to figure out the best way to go about it. But you know what? When the Lord has spoken, there's no best way to go about it. It's just to go. <laughs> just to face it, as he said. And these people again are pleading. Then Paul answered, what do you mean? And you know, this, this came so hard and you know, there's weeping and you know, Paul is saying, you're weeping and you're breaking my heart. For I am ready not only to be bound, but also to die in Jerusalem for the name of of the Lord Jesus Christ. Friends, what does commitment to Christ look like to you? Can you say these words? That I'm ready not only to be bound, but to lose this life for the sake of the name of Jesus Christ. What does commitment to Christ looks like to you. If there were a way to try to define commitment or to learn commitment, it is here in this verse, verses 13. Paul is not just ready to be chained, but he's ready to die. Ready to die. Let 
the man who wrote this hymn, I have decided to follow Jesus. You, just should, you guys should look it up. Very interesting story. This man from India, uh, there, there, there were no missionaries there. There was, there was not the gospel. And then there's a missionary who appeared in a small village and he preached the gospel amidst all the um, rejection and people just not wanting to listen to him because there are a lot of many gods. This one man said, I'm going to follow Jesus. The cross before me, the world behind. I mean, how, how many of us would say it is the cross of Jesus, not the pendant, not the thing that people hang on their necks. If you have one, take it down. You would say it is the cross of Jesus Christ before me, Besides me, everywhere around me, the world is right behind me. I am going to see what the world does. I am going to focus on what the world does. I am going to focus on what God has for me. This guy lost his life and the entire family was wiped away. But in return, many people got born again because of his dedication to Jesus Christ. Is there any willingness in our hearts to let go of the world so that Christ will reign in our lives? Is there any willingness because Paul says, I'm not just ready to be in chains. I'm ready to die. He said it. I know it's true. He said it. I cannot take it back. All I'm praying is that he gives me the strength to go through it. To go through it. And they say, don't go down to Jerusalem. Or don't go down that road. When friends and families have a different opinion of what God is telling you or what he has told you already, do you make a compromise so that you don't lose both sides? Because I love my family, I love my friends so much I'm going to make a compromise so that I'm somewhere there. I don't offend God. I don't offend the family. We're in between. You know what Jesus said? He will spit you up. The lukewarm people. You're neither hot nor cold. He will spit you up. If you have chosen to follow Jesus, please follow Jesus Christ in pain and suffering, in good and bad. You have signed up for it, unless you didn't. If you sign up for it, follow after it. There's also a reward that comes when you stand your ground. Have you noticed that, you know, when you're making very important decisions for your life, there will be many voices. But if you choose to follow the voice of God, even those who had opposed you previously, those who had said things concerning that situation, when you stand your ground, do you know what? They will join in at some point. And you know what? They will respect your decision. But if you're the person or the kind who will be tossed to and fro like wind, they won't respect you. 
If you want to make the stand, this is the day to make the stand. I'm going to follow what God says. I'm not going to involve myself in this business, in this aspect. I'm not going to do them. When you remain steadfast, regardless of the pressing demands to compromise, you will be respected. So these people were telling Paul not to go. They carried themselves with their children and their wives. They went to the shore. <laughs> like, go. And would you say like this group of people again? So when he would not be persuaded, we ceased saying, the will of God be done. When people are telling you what God has told them to do and you have a different opinion and they're so adamant that this is what the Lord has said and I'm going to follow it. Are you going to tell them that, hey, God's will be done? Or you're going to say, you go suffer in your rebellion. <laughs> you're not listening to us. You're not listening to your parents. You're not listening to your elders. You're not listening to your whoever they are. You're not listening. What are you going to say? Are you going to send them with God's blessing and say, God's will be done? It is our desire that you would remain with us. But this one feels like it's beyond us. The Lord is calling you to go. Go in peace. May the Lord be with you. It is very hard, I tell you, very hard for us to let people go and do God's will. We want people to go do things, but our will is part of what they're going to do so that we are part of that success, right? After those days, we parked and went to Jerusalem. Now this was the, you know, the misunderstanding here. Paul is clearing it out. There's no confusion. The Holy Spirit has spoken. I'm going to go down there. Whether it's in life or death, I'm willing to do that. They packed and went to Jerusalem. Also, some of the disciples from Caesarea uh, went with us and brought with them a certain uh, Mnason of Cyprus, an early disciples with whom we were to lodge. And when we had come to Jerusalem, the brethren received us gladly. And on the following day, Paul went in with us to James. This is James, the other brother of Jesus, the son of Joseph and Mary. And all the elders were present. When he had greeted them, he told in detail those things which God had done amongst the Gentiles through his ministry. And when they heard it, they glorified the Lord. This is supposed to be the response every time when we receive good news of the gospel and the testimony of what God has done, then we ought to glorify God for it and not to take it upon ourselves and think we are the great and mighty. And they say to him, you see, brother, how many myriads, that is thousands of Jews, there are who have believed, and they are all zealous for the law. That would seem to pose a problem. They have believed in Jesus Christ, and they're still zealous also for the law. But they have been informed about you that you teach all the Jews who are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, saying that they ought not to circumcise the ch their children, nor to walk according to their custom. Now you see where there is another misunderstanding from the people who are believers. They say, you have taught people to forsake Moses. 
Did Paul teach people to forsake Moses? No, he told them about circumcision. And that is what he told not the Gentile, the Jews, because they were forcing people to say, now that you have received Jesus Christ, there's one thing that remains of you, to be circumcised and you're fully accepted. And Paul said, no, 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 no. And there was a problem. They went back, you remember, Paul went back to Jerusalem and they sent Silas with him and other elders to go tell this church that what they have deliberated upon, which is going to share with us in verses 25. But that was not the case. He had talked about circumcision, but their context is kind of messed up. What then? The assembly must certainly meet, for they will hear that you have come. So all these people who have said these things against you, uh, they've been told this is what you teach, they will hear that you're here with us at Jerusalem. And they will come and ask if these things are so. Therefore, do what we tell you. Do what we tell you. And what is that? We have four men who have taken a vow. Previously, you also remember, Paul had taken a vow, uh, a Nazarite vow, to uh, not shave his head for a period of time, and after those days are done, you cut your hair, you go to the temple, and you burn them, and there is a sacrifice that is offered, a peace offering. That means, you know, there's blood that is shed for this ceremony to happen. And he says, uh, the elders are saying, there are four men who have taken a vow. Take them and be purified with them and pay their expenses. In other words, this is going to hit your pocket also, Paul. Why? Because for every individual, there is a sacrifice that goes with the Nazarite vow that they took. You're going to buy these animals for each uh, of these four men. Uh, you're going to go to the temple. This is going to be sacrificed. And so that the people will see that you're just not a guy who have neglected this part of the law, so that they will know that these other things that are spoken against you are not true. Pay their expenses so that they may shave their heads and that all may know that those things of which they were informed concerning you are nothing, but that you yourself also walk orderly and keep the law. But concerning the Gentiles who believe, we have written and decided that they shouldn't observe no such thing except that they should keep themselves from things offered to idols and from blood, from things strangled, and from sexual immorality. We went through that in chapter 15. Then Paul took the men, and the next day, having been purified with them, entered the temple to announce the expiration of the days of purification, at which time an offering should be made for each one of them. Now when the seven days were almost ended, the Jews from Asia, this is Asia Minor, uh, where Paul had preached before, Derby, Cilicia, they saw him in the temple and they stirred up the whole crowd and laid hands on him, crying out, men of Israel, help. This is the man whom teaches all men everywhere against the people, the law, and this place. And furthermore, he also brought Greeks into the temple and defiled this holy place. For they had previously, this is a little nugget that Luke is telling us. In chapter 6, we had 
read that. They had previously seen um, Trophimus, the Ephesians, with him in the city, whom they supposed that Paul had brought into the temple. It wasn't true. This is just allegation. A lot of misunderstanding is going around here with the religious leaders, with the church. And all the city was disturbed. And the people ran together, seized Paul, and dragged him out of the temple. And immediately the doors were shut. In other words, Paul, you've been running away for years. Today we got you. No going out, nobody comes in. Now, as they were seeking to kill him, This means they are in the process of beating this man. Now, they're seeking to kill him. News came to the commander of the garrison that all Jerusalem was in uproar. He immediately took soldiers and centurions and ran down to them. And when they saw the commander and the soldiers, they stopped beating Paul. Which means if he never showed up, Paul was going to be a dead man. During the process, there's a lot of people beating Paul. Then the commander came near and took him and commanded him to be brought, uh, to be bound with two chains. And he asked, who he was and what he had done. And some among the multitude cried one thing and some the other. Usually the way the crowd does it. <laughs> the, the, the one group is saying this, one group is saying this, and you know, they're saying those things and they're beating you. <laughs> they don't know the reason why they're beating you and they're beating you. So when he could not uh, ascertain the truth because of the tumult, he commanded him to be taken into the barrack. And when he reached the stairs, he had to be carried by the soldier because of the violence of the mob. For the multitude of the people followed after, crying out, away with him. Then, as Paul was about to be led into the barrack, he said to the commander, may I speak to you, sir? He replied, can you speak Greek? Are you not the Egyptian who uh, some time ago started up a rebellion and led the 4,000 assassins out in the wilderness? That is in chapter five. But Paul said, I'm a Jew from Tarsus in Cilicia, a citizen of no mean city. And I implore you, permit me to speak to the people. So when he had given him permission, Paul stood on the stairs and motioned with his hand to the people. And when there was a great silence. He spoke to them in the Hebrew language, saying, No, it's hard to stop from there, right? I mean, how do we know what they said, what he said? The worship team, you're welcome as we read this last passage. They actually are realizing that he's a Hebrew. Brethren and fathers, hear my defense before you now. And when they heard um, that he spoke to them in the Hebrew language, they kept all the more silent. Then he said, I am indeed a Jew born in Tarsus of Cilicia, but brought up in this city at the feet of Gamaliel, 
taught according to the strictness of our Father's law and was zealous towards God as you all are. I persecuted this way, the way uh, to the death, binding and delivering into prison both men and women. As also the high priest bear me witness and all the counsel of the elders. And from whom I also received letters to the brethren and went to Damascus to bring in chain every of those who were um, there to Jerusalem to be punished. Now it happened as I journeyed and come to Damascus at about noon, suddenly a great light from heaven shone around me and I fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to me, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? So I answered, who are you, Lord? And he said to me, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting. And those who were with him indeed saw the light and were afraid, but they did not hear the voice of him who spoke to me. So I said, what shall I do, Lord? And the Lord said to me, arise and go to Damascus, and there you will be told all things which are appointed to you to do. And since I could not see for the glory of that light being led by the hand of those who were with me, I came into Damascus. Then a certain Ananias, a devout man according to the law, having a good testimony with all the Jews who dwelt there, came to me and stood and said to me, Brother Saul, receive your sight. And at that same hour, I looked up at him. Then he said, the God of our Father has chosen you that you should know his will and see the just one and hear the voice of his mouth. For you will be his witness to all men of what you have seen and heard. And now, why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Now it happened when I returned to Jerusalem and uh, was praying in, in the temple that I was in a trance and I saw him saying to me, make haste and get out of Jerusalem quickly for they will not receive your testimony concerning me. So I said, Lord, they know that in every synagogue I imprisoned and beat those who believed on you. And when the blood of your martyr, Stephen, was shed, I also was standing by consenting to his death and guarding the clothes of those who were killing him. Then he said to me, depart, for I will send you far from here to the Gentiles. And they listened to him until this word. That, that's amazing. All these things that Paul was saying, they listened to him until this point. And when he mentioned the Gentiles, they snapped. Everything changed. And they raised their voices and said, Away with such a fellow from the earth, for he is not fit to leave. Then as they cried out and tore off their clothes and threw dust in the air, the commander ordered him to be brought into the barracks and said that he should be examined under scourging. 
so that the so that they might know why they shouted against him. And as they bound him with thongs, Paul said to the centurion who stood by, is it lawful for you to scourge a man who is a Roman and uncondemned? When the centurion heard that, he went and told the commander saying, take care that you what you do for this man is a Roman then the commander came and said to him tell me are you a Roman he said yes the commander answered with a large sum I obtained this citizenship and Paul said also but I was born a citizen then immediately those who were about to examine him withdrew from him and the commander also afraid after he found out that he was a Roman and became and because he had bound him what they did was unlawful the next day because he wanted to know for certain why he was accused by the Jews he released him from the bound and commanded the chief priests and all the, their counsel to appear and brought down Paul and set him before them. This was very interesting. The Lord had told Paul that there is a lot of trouble that is waiting. You're gonna suffer. And if it were Paul, maybe if it were you, you'd say, because I have reached this point, maybe this is the point where they now kill me. You, you, you'd say, God, now take my life. Instead of going through all these pains, now take my life. He still defended his cause. You know, when, when the time is not yet, don't hasten it, for it shall surely come to pass. Paul still say, oh, you guys are doing something that is unlawful. Now even the people who wanted to kill him are now afraid of the person they wanted to kill. Why? Because they are breaking the law. Paul is not that kind of person who wants to break the law for whatever reason. He just wants to do things right. You know, it's, it, it's a tired conversation will continue. But you see the heart of Paul even amidst the tribulation, amidst all this suffering, amidst um, the, 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 the civic leaders bringing him before and say, hey, this man deserves to die. Away with this man. But Paul is right there because he's very convicted and he knows that the Spirit of God is with him and that the Spirit of God will always tell him of what he should communicate to these people. Rightly so. When you find yourself in tough situations, there are misunderstandings. Do you just want to defend yourself? For the sake of it, now, do you want to remember what the Lord had told you before? The reason why you're there. You're going to suffer. You're going to go through this. But you know what Jesus said? Do not be troubled. He's speaking to a troubled people. Do not be troubled. I will be with you until the end of time. For where I am, you will always be, or you will be. If it were not so, I could have not said it. You be with me. I'll be with you. Whether your life ceases now, you'll be with me. Whether it is prolonged for whatever reason, I'm still with, uh, 
I'll, I'll be with you. So friends, the Lord has promised to be with us. Don't fear no evil. Train yourself. On Thursday we were learning what Solomon asked of the Lord. It is a hearing heart. That is what the Lord wants for every one of us to have a heart that will hear the Lord. Amen? Let us pray together. God, we thank you for what you have done. We thank you for your goodness and your mercies that transcends time. And we thank you that you, you have been with us and you are with us. We pray that you, you will help our hearts to get a hold of the promises that you have made that will not depart from them. Help us even when, at times when we are wavering, at times when we are not as steady, help us not to run away from your call. I pray that we will have a heart that is trained to receive and to listen from you and from you alone. And as we give our offerings this morning, also we pray that we we'll give that which honors you for you have blessed us abundantly. We bless you and we thank you in Jesus' name we pray.